The Killer Bee True Crime Series, Episode 3, Gary M. Heidnick, the Madman of Marshall Street. Due to the graphic nature of this killer's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of suicidal ideation, kidnapping, murder, sexual assault, rape, and violence. Betty Heidnick stood facing the corner of the dingy kitchen, sobbing. Her new husband, Gary, had ordered her to stand there until she learned her lesson. But more than 12 hours had passed, and he still wouldn't let her move. Betty now knew she wasn't ever supposed to cross him or question him. She was supposed to show total obedience or pay a steep price. She felt trapped. She traveled so far from her small home in the Philippines to the busy city of Philadelphia, all to become the wife of a respectable American. She thought her life would be like that of a fairy tale, but now, just over a week after her wedding, she realized she stepped into a nightmare. Betty heard Gary moving behind her, watching over her. She remembered the photos he'd sent her. She thought he looked warm, even handsome, but up close. His was not the face of a fairy tale prince. It was the face of pure evil. Gary Michael Heidnick was born in November 1943. His father, Michael, worked as a machinist and also served as a city councilman. His mother, Ellen, was a beautician. The family lived in a quiet, working-class suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, but things were far from perfect. When Gary was two, his parents filed for a divorce. It was not an amicable separation. Each of Gary's parents blamed the other for the split. Michael claimed that Ellen's alcoholism was the cause. While Ellen accused Michael of gross neglect of duty after the divorce, Gary and his younger brother Terry lived with their mother. Later, Terry would recall at some point during these early years, Gary had a dangerous fall from a tree. He supposedly suffered from a head injury. It left his skull permanently deformed. Afterward, other children would tease him, calling him football head. According to his brother, Gary's personality changed after the accident. In particular, he developed a cruel streak. He'd once enjoyed feeding wild animals that wandered onto the property, but after the accident, he began torturing them. Instead, he trapped them, tied them up, and hanged them from trees. He also started getting into more fights with Terry and the other kids in the neighborhood. After the divorce, Gary's mother took care of the kids for a few years, but she couldn't control her heavy drinking, so she returned the kids to the dad. Unfortunately, that wasn't much of an improvement. Michael Heineck was a harsh disciplinarian who frequently beat his sons to keep them in line. He also used humiliation as punishment. During sessions that he later had with psychologists, Gary said that when he wet the bed, his father made him hang the soiled sheets from his second-story bedroom window for all the neighbors to see. And when Gary's father was really angry, he'd grab his son by the ankles and dangle him out the window. Gary's brother Terry described similar abuse. He said that when he and Gary misbehaved, their father would like to paint a bullseye on the seat of their pants before sending them to school so that their classmates would try to kick them. Michael Heineck remarried, but the children found little comfort in their new stepmother, Dorothea. She had no interest in parenting. And in fact, Gary said that she hated him and singled him out for more of Michael's punishments. Unsurprisingly, the abuse took its toll. Gary's life may have appeared normal to most outsiders. He was in the Boy Scouts. He had a paper route. But some members of the community noticed that he was more withdrawn than some of his peers. One of his father's co-workers commented that Gary never seemed to go to dances or play sports. He was more of a loner, as teenagers go. Gary and Terry even tried to run away to California, but they were caught by the police and sent back home. Sometime after this, Gary's father enrolled them into military school. Gary stayed at the school and did well for two years, but then suddenly left. Things were not any better at home, so Gary dropped out of high school in October of 1961. The 17-year-old joined the army. Gary became a medic and was stationed in Germany. It wasn't long after that Gary started having medical problems of his own. Gary claimed that when he was in Germany, the army performed experiments on him using LSD and he suffered a nervous breakdown. There aren't any records of such testing in his file, but it is possible that Gary was right. The U.S. Army did conduct secret hallucinogenic drug research during the Cold War. Gary went to see a neurologist, 
He noted that he displayed signs of mental illness, possibly schizophrenia or schizoid personality disorder. At 18, Gary was transferred back to the States. His doctors found that he was experiencing hallucinations on top of these other symptoms. An army board viewed Gary's case and determined he should be honorably discharged. With that, Gary's military career was over, just after serving 14 months. Gary received a 100% disability rating. This rating is usually reserved for individuals who are virtually unemployable. Gary had attempted suicide several times. He tried everything, overdosing on tranquilizers, ingesting rat poison. He even drove his motorcycle straight into an oncoming truck. Gary was in and out of psychiatric hospitals. Sometimes he would go weeks without speaking. His brother Terry had also been discharged from the military due to mental illness. Like Gary, he was frequently suicidal. In December 1968, the brothers got into a fight. Gary smashed his brother's head with a wooden carpenter's tool, leaving a wound that needed 16 stitches. Terry accused Gary of trying to kill him. Gary calmly replied that if he had wanted to kill Terry, he would have just bashed his head in, placed his body in the bathtub, and dissolved his bones in acid. In 1970, Gary's mother died by suicide. She'd been suffering from cancer. She ended her life by drinking a bottle of mercuric chloride. Despite not seeing her for years, Gary had her cremated and spread her ashes at Niagara Falls. After a lengthy hospital stay for depression, Gary got in his car and drove west. He finally came to a stop at a beach in Malibu. On the beach, he heard the voice of God telling him to start a church. Gary drove back to Philadelphia and started his church. He started going by the new title, Bishop Gary Heinick, now a religious leader. Gary discovered a new feeling he liked, control over others. Linda and Robert Rogers were Gary's tenants and rented the second floor of his house. The Rogers weren't sure what to make of their landlord. It seemed to Robert, who was black, that 32-year-old Gary Heinick was obsessed with race. He heard him make predictions that a race war would someday sweep the nation and also saw him read racist literature from an Aryan organization. Robert found this strange, particularly because Gary was a white man and seemed to date black women exclusively. But Gary's odd attitudes on race weren't the only concern. At the time, Gary was living with a girlfriend, Dorothy Knight. Dorothy was a black lady that had spent most of her life in and out of care facilities due to an intellectual disability. It seemed to Robert that Gary targeted Dorothy just because of her disability. In one of his many psychiatric reports, a doctor wrote that Gary was quite often threatened by women that he would consider to be his equal, intellectually or emotionally. Gary needed constant acceptance and self-assurance, that he was intelligent, worthwhile human being. Linda Rogers said that Gary would beat Dorothy, berate her, criticize her, and even deprive her of food. Linda and Robert tried to help, but they weren't sure how to protect Dorothy. They were very wary of crossing their volatile landlord. And with good reason. In the fall of 1967, Gary got into an argument with Linda. In retaliation, Gary decided to shut off all the utilities to the building. When Robert found out, he tried to get into the basement to turn the power back on, found the door locked. Annoyed, Robert went outside and found a window leading to the cellar. He opened it and started to climb in. Once inside, he found himself face to face with Gary. Gary had been lying in wait for him armed with a rifle and a pistol. Gary told Robert he was going to shoot him and tell the police that he had broken in. Before Robert could retreat, Gary raised the pistol and fired. The bullet grazed Robert's cheekbone just below his left eye. Shortly thereafter, Gary decided to sell the house. The new buyers were dismayed to find the place littered with garbage, pornography, and spent bullet casings. But they found something even stranger in the basement. A large hole excavated in the concrete floor with a depth of about three feet. It was just large enough for a person to fit inside. In 1977, Gary got another girlfriend pregnant, Anne Jeanette. Like his previous girlfriend, she also had an intellectual disability and was unable to read or write. Even though she was pregnant, Gary refused to let her seek medical treatment. The woman's family finally called police to intervene. A month before her due date, She'd only gained five pounds during her pregnancy because Gary had put her on a strict diet. Despite Gary's destructive caregiving, she delivered a healthy baby girl in March of 1978. She was immediately put in foster care. 
Gary was furious the child was taken from him. Gary began plotting another way to have children. In May, Gary and Anjanette drove to see Anjanette's sister, Alberta. Alberta lived in an assisted living facility because of significant intellectual disabilities and she wasn't able to live on her own. Gary and Anjanette obtained a day pass to allow Alberta to leave the facility, but they never came back. A week later, employees went to Gary's house to try to find Alberta. He said he'd given her a bus ticket and sent her back to Harrisburg. He invited them to look around the apartment to prove she wasn't there. They weren't able to find her, but they also didn't believe Gary, so the following day they returned with the police. The police searched the entire building. When they got to the basement, they found an empty storage room in the back. They found Alberta trapped. She was shaking in terror, and when she spotted her caregivers from the center, she rushed over to them and clung to them, refusing to let them go. Doctors found clear evidence she had been raped. Gary was charged with kidnapping, rape, false imprisonment, and unlawful restraint. Gary didn't spend the time waiting for his court date in jail. Instead, he was admitted for psychological treatment at the Veterans Hospital. By the time he faced trial, many of the most serious charges had been dropped because Alberta was deemed not competent to testify against her attacker. Gary was found guilty of lesser charges and sentenced three to seven years in prison. In prison, Gary underwent a lot of psychological testing and evaluations. Records showed that his intelligence was at least 130, close to genius level. They also indicated that he was highly manipulative, insecure, and confused. For the most part in prison, Gary seemed to fly under the radar. The prison guards noted that he rarely spoke. He remained silent for nearly two and a half years. When doctors asked why he wouldn't speak, he would write on a note that the devil had put a cookie down his throat. Gary only began speaking again when officials told him they were terminating his parental rights so that his daughter could be adopted. Gary attempted suicide multiple times in prison. Ultimately, he only served three years of his seven-year sentence. His parole was conditioned on him getting inpatient care at the VA hospital. But once there, the doctors saw no reason to keep him. So he was only there three weeks. Gary bought a home on North Marshall Street in Pennsylvania. It's not clear if he was working during this time, but he often told people he was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He liked the sound of that. It's most likely he was living off his disability benefits, but he still had access to hundreds of thousands of dollars from his investments through his church. With this money, he purchased a Rolls Royce, a Cadillac, and a Lincoln Continental. Gary would drive to a non-profit fast food restaurant that serviced people with various disabilities. He would hang around waiting for women to come by. Neighbors said they often saw Gary bringing home women three or four at a time for group sex. Gary began corresponding with a young woman in the Philippines. They became pen pals. He told her he was a clergyman looking for a wife. And in September of 1985, she received a visa and flew to the United States. She and Gary married three days after her arrival. But almost immediately, Betty found herself living in a nightmare. A week into her marriage, she caught Gary having sex with three women he brought back to their home. He told her that's how marriages worked in America, and he explained he was always going to have sex with other women. When Betty objected, he punched her and forced her to stand in the corner for 14 hours. For the next few months, Betty endured Gary's horrific treatment. He beat her, raped her, forced her to sleep on the dirty floor, deprived her of food, and mocked her. She watched him have sex with other women. Then, Betty discovered she was pregnant. At this point, she realized she couldn't take Gary's abuse anymore. In mid-January 1986, Betty placed her passport and a change of clothes in a bag and hid it behind some bushes in front of the house. She told Gary she was going shopping, but instead, she fled to a women's shelter. She was able to get a protective order against Gary. Betty reported Gary to the police. He was charged with spousal rape, indecent assault, and simple assault. But on the day of the preliminary hearing, Betty never showed up. Without her testimony, the charges against Gary were dropped. On the night of November 26, 1986, a 25-year-old sex worker named Josephine Rivera stood on a corner in Northeast Philadelphia, scouting potential customers. A gleaming white Cadillac pulled up beside her. Gary Heidnick was behind the wheel. He complimented her, telling her she looked like Diana Ross. He offered to pay her $20 for some company and she joined him in the car. 
he drove to a McDonald's and ordered coffee. Then he asked her if she'd come back to his place. She didn't like going home with clients. She would have preferred a brief encounter in the car. But she was a single mother to three children, desperate for the cash. So she agreed. When they got to his house on Marshall Street, she felt apprehensive. It was a strange place. Pennies were glued to the walls in the kitchen, and one and five dollar bills were pasted on some walls upstairs. Despite her trepidations, she followed Gary to his bedroom. He paid her the twenty dollars that they promised, and they had sex. Afterwards, Gary got up and got dressed. Josephine turned to reach for her own clothes, but as she reached for her jeans, she felt Gary's hands wrapping around her throat. Gary squeezed tighter, and just as she was passing out, he let go. By the time she was able to understand what was going on, he'd ordered her to stand up and put her hands behind her back. Terrified, Josephine obeyed. A moment later, she felt the cold metal of a pair of handcuffs locking around her wrist. Gary forced her down one set of stairs, and then another into the basement, where he guided her into an old mattress laying on the floor. He then reached into a nearby cardboard box and pulled out a pair of old muffler clamps meant to fit around a car's exhaust pipe. Gary tied the clamps around Josephine's ankles. He then grabbed a metal chain and secured one end to the clamps. The other looped around a pipe running along the ceiling. Josephine was trapped, chained like a prisoner. She was frozen with fear, but terrified once she noticed the large hole hollowed out of the concrete floor. She felt like she could be staring at her own grave. This has been part one of episode three of the Killer Bee True Crime Podcast. Stay tuned for part two of the Marshall Street Madman. Thank you for listening. God bless.